Bun găsit, doamnelor, bun găsit, domnilor, sunt Marius Constantinescu. În episodul de astăzi al emisiunii Ediție Limitată, îl cunoaștem pe autorul acestui roman multifacetat ca un vitraliu sau ca un basm rusesc. Romanul se numește Fica Măcelarului, iar autorul este Ianiv Itzkovț. Yaniv, thank you so much for accepting this uh, interview for the Romanian national television. Uh, we have uh, some minutes, uh, quite a copious amount of time, to talk about uh, this book, The Slaughtered Man's uh, Daughter, uh, a book that um, I would say took the world by storm uh, <laughs> since uh, it appeared a couple of years ago and uh, still makes waves um, everywhere. Um, it's been a book that um, most critics and also the readers qualified um, as a book about uh, a specific term, Jewishness. <laughs> yeah. How would you define this term? Wow, Jewishness is a, is a very complicated term. Uh, and uh, you know it has a it has a let's say a scientific definition which i utterly reject which is uh, that if you are born to a jewish mother then you are a jew okay this is just like that just like that simple like that doesn't the father is uh, is irrelevant uh, and i feel that uh, jewishness is something more connected to the culture of uh, especially uh, your ability to communicate with Jewish books and Jewish traditions and, uh, you know, read the Bible, read uh, all sorts of stories. And for me, it's much more important than, you know, the genetic or biological. I mean, you can be a Jew if you want, but you would have to find a certain connection to the Jewish culture. Uh, and I believe that many people in Israel are completely secular, mm -hmm. you know, they don't follow any tradition, but they still feel Jewish in a way. The book uh, has been also an instrument for you in order to reconnect with this culture? Yes. Yes, 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 because, uh, um, you know, in, in Israel, obviously, uh, we try to build a new Jew, which is something that has roots in Israel and is not connected to the roots in Europe or America or whatever. And I think that basically maybe it was the right move in 48, but now everyone wants to be reconnected with the roots. You know, I want to know where did my parents came from? Where did my grandfather came from? What did they do day to day life in Romania, in Czech? Slovakia, in Poland, in Russia. So everyone wants to know uh, more about uh, what happened before Israel was uh, founded. Well, um, it's also uh, a book uh, about a community that has been persecuted for centuries and yes. centuries, or at least this is uh, a common place when we think about uh, the Jewish uh, community. Um, your intention was to uh, underline this aspect or rather to keep a certain distance from this uh, general trait? This is a very good question because what we learn in Israel is that basically Jewish life in Europe were, uh, uh, you know, an eventful uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, disaster of pogroms, of yes. anti-Semitism, and, and some of it is basically true. But on the other hand, it's not probable that Jewish people lived in uh, Eastern Europe for many many years and all they experienced is that because the daily lives of uh, you know normal people in the shtetls were very much ordinary and organized and uh, and for example i will tell you some fact that i learned that most pogroms when they happened they didn't happen within the boundaries of the town it wasn't that your neighbor came to you with an ex and you know uh, killed you it was basically people from the outside that were mostly sent by political uh, organizations or movements so you know you have to uh, you you have to be honest and and if you want to learn more about yourself then you have to see 
their daily lives were not only that. There were much more. The, the culture was very rich and uh, uh, the community was not just a one-sided face of people. They had many intrigues, conflicts, different beliefs, sects. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, this is Jewish life in Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the topic of the anti-Semitism uh, would require a special interview in itself. But I would ask you, um, what do you think that lies at, uh, at the core, at the root of this strong tendency in Europe towards the Jewish community? Um, I think that, uh, you know, um, I think that y you can call it anti-Semitism and uh, I really believe that some of it is related to, to the Jews specifically, but you can also call it racism, which is basically, uh, I think it derives from fear, from fear and from being threatened by a very different form of life. So imagine that you are in the 19th century and I don't know, you're a farmer, and then you see all these weird people with uh, beards and hats, and they're wearing black, even if it's summer, they're wearing coats, and, and you, are, you fear that this form of life will somehow uh, compromise your identity, uh, will compromise your ability to earn money, your compromise, everything. So I think basically the, the, the source of every form of racism is fear. Yes. And the only way maybe, not the only, but some of the ways to kind of uh, uh, step out of it is, is stepping into a different world through fiction, through art, through, you know, whatever we can do. And uh, specifically towards Jews, I think that... Um, you know, uh, it's sometimes even more threatening that this other form of life that you see has a lot of merits and it's also a bit successful, you know, uh, and they take care of each other and you are not sure whether their loyalty is to the country or to their community. So I read, for example, it's very funny, but... Uh, uh, you know, the Tsar, Nikolai I, he sent uh, his officials to all the Russian Empire asking them, you have to bring me a report about uh, the Jews. And they go back and they tell him, you, you know, the Jews are they're very active, they're very important for the economy, they're very important, you know, everywhere you go, they, they, they are there, they will sell, they will buy, they will drive you. They will uh, give you beer if you want. But the only problem with them is that they are not very loyal. And he asks them why. And they say, well, we saw uh, Jews selling uh, crops to the Russian army. And then they crossed the border to the Ottoman Empire and they sold uh, the crops to the Ottoman army. So, you know, so Nikolai I said, well, we can't let this happen. They need to be loyal. And now the only way to make them loyal is to recruit them to the army, which is basically, I think, uh, one of the ways that people dream of, you know, when you're threatened by someone, then you say, okay, I will force him now to become, you know, a full-fledged Russian or Polish or Romanian or Hungarian or whatever. And it never works. You know, it never works. So I think that when you feel this threat or fear, you have to find a ways, other ways to reconnect with, uh, with the minority. I know that we've tried to do it in Israel and we <laughs> fail, <laughs> but uh, this is the only way.
Ianiv Iscoviț s-a născut în 1975, iar bunicii lui sunt din Ungaria, Cehoslovacia și România. După studiile efectuate la Tel Aviv, a fost Chevening Fellow la Oxford University și a urmat studii postdoctorale timp de un an la Columbia University din New York. Doi dintre compatrioții lui, Eșcol Nevo și David Grossman, îl consideră pe Ianiv Iscoviț drept autorul israelian al momentului. Going back to what you said uh, earlier about this uh, uh, fear that fuels many of uh, yes. the errors uh, of the past, I would ask you, uh, can fiction cure or at least remedy uh, some of these uh, flaws in a retrospective way? Um, well, I don't want to sound naive uh, uh, because I don't think that fiction can change the world and you know but I can tell you for myself you know when I was uh, uh, discharged from the army and I started to read the books then it allowed me to step into different worlds you know and uh, and to realize that uh, the fact that I was born in a certain place at a certain time doesn't mean that I own Uh, the truth. So this is this is the 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 for me at least the most important thing in fiction, the ability to step into another world, and experience it from within, and not in an idealized matter. Because you know I'm not presenting the Jews here as you know totally. those uh, you know sacred communities yes. that were butchered uh, 50 years later. And uh, this is the only way I know uh, to do it. Well, uh, to me, this is also uh, a book about uh, a language and about the culture that stands behind that uh, language. We're talking about the Yiddish language. And um, I would ask you, how do you see this mirroring between the language and the community that speaks that language? There has to be a, a really strong connection and uh, I think that the language uh, is part of, well, it's, it's a central part of who you are in, in, a, in a cultural and mental way and Yiddish is a language that was meant to preserve Jewish life uh, and help them deal within themselves and in front of the other communities that they live. So if you were like, uh, I don't know, uh, you are a Russian and you have a Jewish community in your town, if you don't know Yiddish, you, you don't understand what they're speaking. And it's also part of this threat. Why aren't they speaking Russian, right? It's like we have 20% uh, of our population is Arab and they speak Arab amongst them. And, you know, Israel, Israel, most Israelis, they don't understand Arab. So it automatically creates a certain suspicion between sides. But Israelis, uh, um, you know, for example, if you want to change Israel today, what I would do is, first of all, all the Israelis need to learn Arab. This is first and foremost. It should be mandatory in the education, uh, system in Israel. So going back to the to the to the Yiddish, Yiddish was a language that was meant for Jewish people uh, to deal with the world. So they used it a lot for humor. Uh, you know, they used to laugh about themselves, they used to laugh about their neighbors. And uh, and when Israel was founded then one of the first things that happen is that here we are not going to speak Yiddish. Mm -hmm. No Yiddish anymore. Uh, you could also get a ticket from a police officer if you speak Yiddish on the street in the 50s, back then. Because it was very important to, uh, for Israel then to release itself from the mentality of the Yiddish. The mentality of, you know, being a closed community with its own language, no connection to the, to the environment. And I think that uh, we lost a lot from, uh, from the fact that we don't know Yiddish anymore. We lost a lot of the humor, a lot of the softness, 
a lot of, uh, you know, you can see Israeli fiction today, it's very serious, it's very heavy, mm -hmm. you know, it's very symbolic. And uh, this is some, a lot of it was because we, we left, we left Yiddish, we left humor, yes. we left... Uh, there is a certain exuberance that yes. somehow lacks um, bef yes. because uh, of this, uh, yes. of this um, abandoning uh, of, uh, yes. of, a certain, of a certain language. The novel um, weighs on the shoulders uh, of one extremely important feminine character uh, that is funny. Uh, most uh, readers and critiques um, resembled funny to the bride in uh, Tarantino's <laughs> yeah. Kill Bill. I have also thought about uh, the heroines from Thelma and Louise, uh, if we uh, maintain this cinematographic uh, approach. Yeah. Uh, but uh, she is the reason. Uh, that um, uh, most of the readers define your novel as uh, also a feminist one. Do you agree? Yes, <laughs> I agree because uh, you know when when I started to write this book, so I needed to choose a protagonist, and it was very clear to me that it's going to be a woman because uh, you know men uh, invent you know in Judaism. Basically, it's a very patriarchal uh, religion. So uh, men can basically, uh, you know, go away from home for a few years and the women are chained. They yes. cannot get a divorce. And this, I, I'm writing about 19th century, but this exists also today because it's a, it's a religious law. You cannot change very easily religious laws. So it was clear to me that the pro protagonist has to be a woman. As much as it's clear to me that uh, the world needs to change in many respects for, you know, I, w I would wish that in my country, if you look uh, at, uh, you know, central position. I would really like women to take uh, more dominant roles because uh, what I see is more of the same, you know, more and more of the same. We have generals taking uh, dominant positions and you get from them the same perspective, the same military perspective. And even if they are not generals, they, are, they adopt the, the, the military perspective and, you know, I think that the world requires something different today. Strangely enough, um, uh, Fanny remains alone in the novel. She doesn't gather a community, a women community, to uh, stand up for her attitude, for her uh, approach. She just pursues uh, her quest alone in this kind of uh, road novel, but also a novel that uh, leads to her rediscovering herself yes. through motherhood right. as well. Right. Uh, it's a good point because uh, I think that uh, if you ask me why is the world not like that today? And I think that a lot of it is coming from, from women who are not willing to, 
step up and say, well, we are feminists. Yes. You know, uh, I, I meet a lot of readers and I'm, I'm uh, constantly surprised by how women are afraid to define themselves as feminists because they perceive it as something maybe, maybe, I don't know, it's confrontational, maybe they don't want to be perceived as such. Uh, so, so yeah, and, 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 and I think that relating to Fanny, I'm sure, well, at least when I wrote about her, I'm pretty much sure that her journey is not only to get Zvimeir back. Yes, totally. So I think that she feels that uh, even if Zvimeir wouldn't leave his house, she would find another reason to to go to, to go. just walk away yeah to break the boundaries to break the walls and go out to this crazy journey uh, which she will probably not come back from because it's very very dangerous in the wild east back then uh, and yeah i think this is the only way uh, to do it how do you react when you turn yourself into just a reader of your own books? <laughs> um, it's funny because, uh, you know, uh, I read my book on average 200 times or something like that because when you edit, yes, I know. so um, I have this process when I write that uh, I read it and I reread it and I reread it and now at fifth and sixth time I start thinking to myself, well, this book is really bad, <laughs> you know, because uh, I'm fed up with it. And then I force myself to take long stops. Like, you know, I do something else and I go back to it after a month or two and I try to read it in, 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 with fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. But also then there comes a point when I feel that uh, this book is so bad that if I'm not going to publish it now, I would uh, put it in the drawer. And this is where I tell my publisher, okay, let's, uh, yes. you know, let's stop editing because right now I feel that I'm on the verge of being disconnected to the book. So when the book is published, I try to stay away from it for, for as many as I can. I try to, and I never reread it again. Even when the translation process starts and I get the version in English, I'm so fed up with it that it's uh, hard for me even to read the English version. Thank God you don't hit the recycle bin though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it's stay very tempting. Stay away of the it's recycling. It's very bin. tempting. It's very, you know, writers used to burn. Yeah. Their, now there's the recycle bin. So. Exactly. So the drawer yeah. is just fine. <laughs> it can lay there yeah. for, a, for a while.
În Rusia sfârșitului de secol al XIX-lea se petrece acest roman în spirală, o poveste ale cărei meandre și fluturări de aripi au ceva din exuberanța scripcarului de pe acoperiș. În 2021, romanul Fica Măcelarului de Ianiv Iscoviț a primit premiul literar Wingate, iar The Economist și The Sunday Times au numit cartea drept una dintre cele mai bune traduse în limba engleză în anul 2020. Ianiv Itzkoviț este invitatul nostru special la ediție limitată aici pe TVR2. Over time uh, in this process of uh, writing and also editing and yes. reading and rereading, do you get to uh, have certain empathies with uh, some of the characters more than the others i will tell you my favorite character yeah. from the novel yeah. after your answer okay and now i'm curious yes. <laughs> um, of course i there are some characters that are more empath empath empathetic to uh, that i am more in sync with i i for example novak for me mm -hmm. even though he's supposed to be the villain but I'm very much uh, uh, connected to his uh, biography. Uh, I think that we've gone through similar uh, uh, routes. Um, yeah, so there are places where I feel more connected, but I have to say that uh, I can't write about uh, someone without being connected to a very uh, specific and integral part of his, uh, of his being. So. If you, if I'll take all the characters in the book, I always have to find something in them that I truly identify with. Even if Fanny is, uh, you know, I'm a vegetarian and she used to slaughter animals. Yes. So uh, I have to even find a way to connect with her desire to slaughter animals. So uh, if I couldn't connect with it, I couldn't write it. Well, um, my favorite character from the novel is, uh, strangely enough, Rivka. Rivka ah, Kaisman. Of course. I love her. She's so, <laughs> so well balanced and um, crafted yeah. and full of humor. And of course, humor is such an important ingredient uh, in this novel. And also, as we were uh, talking before, uh, the humor addressed to yourself, to yes. the community that uh, you represent. Um, and um, I was also uh, thinking about the way you draw your characters, because uh, as the novel evolves, you see them adding more and more facets, more yes. and more aspects, more and yes. more traits. Yeah, I have, a, I have a, a, a custom with characters that, you know, I have a, like my notebook, my character's notebook, and uh, I have like uh, this t a rule, it's called uh, the 10% rule, which means that I start uh, doing some research on the character and uh, with, with, my, with the intention of giving in the book only 10% of this information. So I feel like when I start to write about someone, I really know them very well, I ask them, a lot of questions that I know that are not going to be in the novel. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, uh, what did you like to eat when you were a kid? Or uh, what was your favorite, uh, I don't know, uh, thing in the afternoon that you like to play? And I know it's not going to be in the novel, but this is my way to feel very uh, close to them. We develop, you know, a certain intimacy. And then, uh, when I start to write about them, I sort of scatter all the information. You know, I don't like uh, the word exposition, mm -hmm. because you feel as if in the beginning of the book you need to yes. put all the facts and now you have the characters. And I think that an exposition is something that goes along the entire book almost. So uh, this is my, my way with, uh, 
with characters. There are also some quite graphic uh, fragments in your novel. Uh, the slaughtering of the dog in the first chapters is yes. one of them. Then, of course, there are some, some episodes similar to this uh, in the army uh, part, both with uh, Zizek, with Adamski, um, involving all sorts of anatomical and um, organic details, I would say. How do you know where to draw the line? <laughs> um, well, if you're talking about uh, the, the toilet pits <laughs> in particular, um, it's, it's funny because, uh, you know, I was a soldier and, uh, and some of my experience were very similar. Yes. So when they tell you now you need to go and clean the toilets, then everything is from my experience. Mm -hmm. But when you come to fiction, so I'm not talking about myself, I'm not talking about my experience, I'm talking about them. And I think it's, I use the line, uh, I draw the line whenever I feel that it's no longer relevant to understand the character or the story. So, for example, this specific example is that, you know, uh, the story of Zizek and Adamski is really a tragic one. Yeah. You know, you're taking kids, you're kidnapping kids out of their beds. Yes. You put them on a wagon. The they Jewish have no kids, choice, absolutely. Yes, it's connected to what I said earlier, like you need to, Nikolai the first said, okay, we need to draft them, we need to recruit them. And... Uh, Obviously, the Jewish community, they don't want to give in their kids. So now they need to kidnap them from the beds. You put them on a wagon and you send them to a Russian army yeah. camp. And now for 30 or 40 years, they don't go back to their hometown. And they're just kids. They're kids with, uh, you know, with the Jewish... Uh, uh, ...beliefs and the, the hats and... Uh, now they are thrown into a, an army base camp and uh, they can't be Jewish anymore mm -hmm. because they can't eat kosher, they can't pray, they can't go to a synagogue. And now they are thrown to the toilet pits to clean. Yes. So I think that you need to be graphic in order to understand what the child is experiencing at this point. But once you did that, you don't need to go Further. further. So, I don't, I, by the way, I don't know if the line is correct, but it's only my intuition. Absolutely. You know, so, yeah. Even in slaughtering animals, where is the line? How much you describe the act of uh, slaughter, mm -hmm. you know? But I think you should go as much as you can because then you discover things. For example, the most important revelation for me about Fanny, the main character, is that she doesn't only kill human beings by slaughtering them, but she does it in a kosher way. Yes. So when I realize that she has to do it in a kosher way, you know, we have very specific rules about how to cut the animal, and then she uh, executes it with human beings. So when I realize uh, the connection between slaughtering animals and starting to kill people, then I felt that I really know her for the first time.
Well, as I was saying uh, before, uh, there is a strong um, humor aspect in the yeah. novel. Um, and uh, for uh, the end of our conversation, I would ask you again about uh, the, I would call it the, the curing value of humor yes. today, because apparently we live in a world uh, where wherever we turn our head to, there is a, a drama, there is a conflict, uh, there is tragedy around mm. us, and uh, sometimes we only have humor in order to shield ourselves right. from right. this. Right. Uh, so how do you see uh, the humor applied uh, to fiction, but also to reality? Um, I, I think that humor is, is a very important tool in fiction because, uh, first of all, and most importantly, it allows you not to be didactic. And I think that being didactic is a very uh, uh, bad disease in fiction, you know, uh, um, that we all got from the great Russian writers, you know, like uh, Tolstoy always has this character, which is Tolstoy, <laughs> which is not a real character, but it, it, it says what Tolstoy wants us to think about the entire situation, you know, like Levin in Anna Karenina or, so I think that, first of all, it allows you not to be didactic. Uh, second of all, and this is maybe even more important, it, it, you have, in a way, as a writer, you have to play with a paradox, uh, which is you have to believe that what you're doing is very serious, and you have to realize that what you're doing will not do anything in the world, and you can't take yourself too seriously. Uh, and you have to hold both uh, balls, uh, which basically they don't have any connection between them. Uh, because if you are too serious, then um, in a way you are losing the most important perspective that you need to have as a writer, which is the external perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and if you are joking all the time, then, you know, it's not, it's not what people, it's not the reason why people read books. They have comedians, they have uh, stand-up comedy, they have television, they will not read the book if all, all you want to do is make them laugh. Yes. So th this balance is very important and I feel that uh, uh, Israeli fiction in general uh, needs to uh, become more and more friendly with the concept of humor because we live in a very tense and intense reality so we feel that we need to reflect that in our books but it doesn't work mm -hmm. the readers are only taking more and more distance from pushed away yeah. from from our fiction because they they don't want to open the book and get what they get in the news and they don't want to open the book and get what they get in op-eds, in newspapers. Mm -hmm. They want a different perspective. They want to see their world in a different way. They want to experience themselves or other selves in, in, a, in a unique way. And humor is the, maybe the most important tool uh, to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Doamnelor, domnilor, ediția limitată de astăzi se închide aici. Sunt Marius Constantinescu, citiți nelimitat! limitat.